Greetings comrades, my name is Dragantles and in today's video I'm going to be explaining to you well for Life at University video, I'm going to be explaining to you why I I, you know, I'm really good at coming up with these really strange titles, you know that, I really am Now the reason why I'm saying that my sleep is dangerous is actually, it relates to the, to the current weather down here Now, and it also relates to the windowsill there you see, back in my in my um, in my accommodation in my first year, because I've had this this room for the last two years. In my first year at university, I had a I had a room, and the windowsill was very narrow. It was very narrow. I, I could barely fit uh, my pot, my plants on the windowsill. They they stuck off a little bit, so I had to be careful not to knock them off and they smash. This year, the windowsill, okay, well, the last two years, the windowsill up there. It's really deep. It's a really wide windowsill, so it's longer than my. It's effects. It's longer than this, basically. Okay, so you've got the window. The window is the width. Then this is the end of the windowsill. The window would be beyond here, so it's it's quite deep. Now, although this is good because it means I can you know, I can kneel that I can you know, like I can go on my bed. I can I can kneel on my bed and then put my arms on the windowsill and just look outside for whatever reason. And also I can move my plants around as much as I want up there. The problem is during the winter. Now the I told you this before I think in my summer videos it gets very hot in this room but it also in in the summer but it also gets very cold and the problem is that my central heating only goes on for like 5 minutes at a time and so during the during the during the winter when it gets really cold because of the size of this windowsill it means that it's very easy for the air inside that windowsill to get cold and the only way I can really combat this is if I close the curtains I have to close them like this. Okay, give me a second. So as you can see, I've had to basically close off. Not only do I have to actually uh, close the curtains, but I also have to put them on the windowsill. And that's to stop the, all the cold air coming down. Because otherwise, if I let just if I just let this hang off, what's going to happen is throughout the night there's going to be a steady stream of cold air basically falling onto my face. Because I sleep there, okay? That's my head. My head goes there. Okay, if I'm sleeping here, you, it's all going to come down onto my head here. Ah! I just hit my knee. Ow. Okay. Anyway, now as as I was saying, the problem with that's better. As I was saying, the problem with this windowsill now is that because of, if this if this windowsill was narrower, it would have been it would have been a lot a lot safer. But if I but because of the sheer depth of this windowsill, it means that when when the cold air trapped when the air trapped on the inside on the other side of the curtain, when that starts cooling down, it sort of builds almost like a pillow, like a pillow of cold air. And if I move this curtain in any way, that cold air is going to start spilling outwards. And I know this because I don't know. I know it's cold because cold air, cold air, as you know, sinks. Sometimes later at night, what I do is I, if 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 I lift up the base of the of the curtain, I can actually feel the cold air flowing onto my hand. It's freezing. If I put my hand higher up, like you, as you may imagine, there's a tiny bit of a gap at the top of the window. If I put my hand up there, it's actually fine. It's relatively fine. But seriously, the transition from my room to the windowsill, the temperature drops several degrees. I remember, I remember last year there was actually ice forming on on the um, on the inside of my window because it was so cold that part of the windowsill. So my problem now is that every every night I have to make sure that the base is properly closed and there's no gaps anywhere like the lower half of the window because otherwise cold air will basically be streaming out into my face. And if I'm sleeping and I end up smacking the curtain and it opens, there's gonna be a blast of cold air smacking me in the face too, and that's gonna definitely make that's gonna make sleeping very hard for me. Those of you out there who've ever had maybe cold water poured on them, you could probably imagine how how like shocking, and you know, sh not just shocking like <gasps> surprise, but just actually you know, not, not almost like a body going to shock, just like you're frozen like what because of the because of something cold hitting you, and the problem with the cold air is that unlike cold water, you 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 shouldn't really breathe in cold water, you shouldn't breathe in water in it, water in general, but when you when you're busy sleeping, okay, and you're all calm. And your body temperature is slightly, slightly lower than normal as it is when sleeping 
and you breathe in a thing of cold air, it's gonna make you really uncomfortable in your lungs and your throat and everything. And the last thing I need is that to happen to me. I just wake up feeling like I'm being suffocated by a cold pillow. So that, that curtain is the one thing keeping me safe during these, uh, during these winter months. And it's so cold that I actually have to take that. I, I've got a little, little cabinet down here, okay? A little cabinet. And I, it's on wheels, so I can move it around whenever I want. I have to actually take my plants off the windowsill when it starts getting dark and put them onto my cabinet and they stay there, they stay there the whole night until the next morning when I wake up. Because it is so cold that, the, that ice will... I've, I haven't seen it happen yet, fortunately, and it may damage them if it does. But I've seen ice form on the inside of this window I, and I do not want my plants to actually freeze because they're, they're meant to be tropical plants and that's going to be but they're not prepared for something like that so yeah, yeah speaking of my plants um Zabrina my Thanksgiving cactus she's now blossoming again though it's more like she's gonna she would she started blossoming around uh, Thanksgiving last year but she turns out she's actually gonna start blossoming now in uh, in Christmas around Christmas because I've definitely messed up my plant's calendar. But that means I've got beautiful flowers to look forward to, even if I did mess up the calendar somewhat for my plants. And so that curtain right now is, okay, not right now, because my plant's still up there, because it's a bit warm, but but, uh, but basically that curtain is currently keeping me and my plants safe from the freezing cold. Something I've also noticed when it came to stuff on Facebook, it's, it's a bit strange. Like, I told you before how there's one group I'm in that is, always always arguments okay always arguments because there's there's a, there's some cat there's a lot of catholics and a lot of anti-catholics something i've really noticed is just how almost like close a community we all are on facebook me and other apologists and people who are in a sense we're very vigorous in defending the faith obviously there'll be some people saying this is heretical and stuff in the comments but there's almost like a select few obviously not just a few but there's there's a, there's a community of people who are actually out there engaging arguing with the you know the finer details and everything of the faith and it turns out I'm, I'm one of that community like i see these people in this group in this group i'm in and i realize and i'm in a, i'm in a whole bunch of other groups and i see that these people i'm like that these people that i'm working alongside to defend the faith in this really aggressive uh, discussion group they're all they're all admins and moderators and pages and catholic pages in other in other uh, catholic apologetics groups so they they have an active part in pro in posting material and stuff and they act, and they just like me. They actually gain experience from argue, uh, from arguing with anti-Catholics in this group that we're all in. So it's a bit strange, like how it's almost like you're, it's almost like this argument page, uh, this argument group. It's almost like it's our workplace. And so they're just meeting these uh, other admins or moderators who are who are in their own groups or in their own pages. It's so it's almost like you just meet a friend off work and you go, oh hey, how you doing? Because we 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 recognize each other now. No, not just the names, also the profile images, but it's incredible how just this there's this there's this community of apologists, Catholic apologists out there who are they they all do their own thing, but they all come together onto the same battleground to work together and, and combat heresy and stuff, taking the experiences and the information they learned and putting that in their own pages and, and groups and stuff. And I know that because several of them have I, some of several of them in admins in other groups that I'm in. They've actually come forward and said, "I really like your, I really like what you've said in this context." I go, "Oh, thank you," and they go and put that in their own group, which is good. And I hope, and hopefully, I can do that also with my own, um, my own Catholic apologetics page, Gigantian Apologetics. Please do follow that to learn like that if you haven't already. So it's it's nice to know that we're it's not just a one man effort here. That we're all we're all a community, all working together to learn and teach and stuff. Though to be honest, there's not really anything to be concerned about because when dealing with these anti-Catholics. It's laughable their claims. They always put. It's usually, uh, usually one of three. The three main things they do. One, memes. Memes you can refute easily. Two, more in depth in a sense, articles. You can refute those as well. Three, preaching videos. Like there's this one person who's spamming every. She she spam, okay. I believe yes, she she spams all three of these things. But she always puts forth these preaching videos in which they're, they're um. These people are in like Rome or something, preaching against the Catholic Church or world or something, and it's it's really weird. Like these are the sort of street preachers that you would stay away from because they're more annoying than anything, and it's also hypocritical in a few things that she's like 
when when she puts forth these links these street of these street preachers the things that they're like oh, the preachers talking about corruption and stuff in the church and we and then i put them in the comments i go seriously and then i put forward links in the in that in the comments of that post to talk about corruption in her own uh not church she's and she's apparently just a born-again christian so i point out the hypocrisy of born-again christian uh, born-again christians are bad examples of theirs and i go why are you cutting this out? You're making it seem like the church is some sort of corrupt organization when there's corruption across all churches. That doesn't that doesn't mean that they're fake. Not necessarily fake. Not that, that that's a Tukoke argument. It's not. It's just incredible how much their arguments are cropped and tailored to focus solely on the Catholic Church while ignoring problems within their own churches. There was another guy, a Baptist. He says that apparently there weren't any sources within 50 years after St. Ignatius of Antioch died that mentioned him. And so that means he's fake, and that's stupid. He's he's more he's not even trying to put forward a proper argument. He's actually trying to promote a book he wrote called The Peter Myth, and I I was, I was, I was talking with him because he keeps quoting his book and trying to promote it. And I said, "Did you actually take this to an academic site or a, or or an academic journal to just to critic to, to just to critique it, see what they think?" And he goes, I've been trying to have discussions with Catholics about this, but they keep, but they keep, but they keep refusing to read it. And I go, I didn't say Catholics. I said scholars. I said academics. Regardless whether they're, regardless or not whether they're Catholic, regardless or not if they actually support the Bible, Bible or, or are against it or just Christianity, whatever. This person is so focused on his own like little bubble that he's not, and he's and trying to promote his own book. He's not. He's never. He hasn't taken his apparent masterpiece of biblical scholarship and actually go and have it, actually had it sent for critique. I'm trying to write my dissertation right now. Okay, I am, and I have to send that off to be critiqued by someone because I can't. I know that I can't just publish an article and necessarily expect everyone to say, "Oh, that's brilliant." It needs to be. It needs to be critiqued. It needs to have its flaws worked out so I can put forward a good article. Okay, it's good dissert. A good dissertation. But he puts forth this book that he wrote as some sort of proof without it ever actually receiving criticism. So how can it be trusted? And it can't. So I don't know why it took me so long to say something, but that's the point. It can't be trusted because he hasn't received any criticism at all. And it's more of a, it's quite an insult because I'm in a lot of, um, a lot of groups where there are people promoting books, but these are, these are actually biblical scholars or Catholic theologians. They actually publish books. They say, they, do they ask for opinions? Yes. But then they also ask for specific opinions of our actual academics who are in those groups, and that's this is although, although uh, I'm not trying to pull the fallacy of okay, what well, if a professional agrees with it, then it must be true. But the fact is that the more also numbers, numbers aren't necessarily a problem. But this isn't. I'm not employing any logical fallacies here. Just bear with me. If your book has 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 received or reports whatever has received criticism from a group of people as opposed to just you promoting it then it's going to be more accurate because the more people you introduce the more people who read your book the more, the more people who critique it the better idea you're going to get of just how accurate it is just how well written it is and the case presented and everything even if maybe maybe, maybe it may it might be true but only receive maybe 40 percent support but there's a very big difference between being a minority supported book versus not receiving any criticism at all it's better to have opinions of academics people who've spent decades of their lives actually looking at this sort of stuff especially in the in the biblical world where i'm not kidding okay if you if you add up the life experience of all biblical scholars out there you will have thousands of years worth of experience i'm not saying they've lived thousands of years i'm just saying that couldn't they, if you added all their years of experience up together but that's something I never want to do. I never want to be like these self-published authors who just write something and represent that as fact, because that's wrong. That's not the attitude to have. That's not the attitude to have in an in an in the academic world and promoting something like that, especially with a claim as absurd as Saint Ignatius of Antioch not existing. But that's it effectively for this week. So we have dangerous uh, dangerous curtain conditions there. Keep you, the curtain keeping me alive from dangerous cold and terrible central heating in my accommodation. We have the online community of Catholic apologists. We all know each other, which is good. Um, irritating street preacher posts, being hypocritical and the arguments tailored solely to attack the church whilst not recognizing problems within their own churches and denominations, whatever. And a strange book that 
it completely ignores the existence of, of St. Ignatius of Antioch, not ignores but tries to refute it and give an excuse to ignore his epistles as being written apparently in the 3rd or 4th century instead of the 2nd century. Fun times. That's it for this video, so if you like this video please give a like, please do share my videos and please do comment what you think of them and any other videos you want me to do. Please do, subscribe, please do subscribe to my channel so you can see more of this content and please do ring the bell so you, so you can keep updated. So you can keep up to date with my video releases. Sorry, I'm still trying to work on something down. Also, please do subscribe, uh, like, and follow my Facebook page, uh, Gigantian Apologetics, or just look up Gigantals because you'll find it as well. Not sure what ha not sure what will happen next week, but you know I'm going home soon anyway. I don't have many lessons left, so maybe not necessarily next week, but the week after, you'll probably see me back in my home accommodation. But that's all for then. So, mate, God bless you all. See you next video, comrades. Until then.